Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Fluctus channel. Out of every country in the world, U.S. Navy has the most ships and the highest horsepower on open seas. In fact, many civilians wouldn't believe the special techniques U.S. Navy ships used to fight dangerous storms at sea. With an arsenal of amphibious ships and aircraft carriers at its disposal, the U.S. military never runs out of options. However, it's rare to encounter one with as fascinating a history as U.S. destroyers. First coined in the late 1800s, the word destroyer has been used to describe well-known naval vessels for over a century. Commonly used to protect military convoys and surface fleets, these speedy boats were a wartime staple in World War I. That's when the U.S. Navy deployed them before soldiers entered the battlefield to search for the adversary's fleet. Once there, they would fight fire with fire, cannon fire to be exact. This was used to destroy the enemy's vessel before torpedoes were launched to sink the opposition's cruisers and battleships. As submarines became the best way to shoot torpedoes at sea, U.S. destroyers were revamped with depth charges and hydrophones to spot a sneaky sub-attack. War tactics became more advanced during World War II, which saw the addition of anti-aircraft guns and radar to these speedy ships. They even turned their guns and torpedoes on other surface-style ships in the Pacific theater, playing an integral role against the Japanese in World War II. Elsewhere in the Pacific Ocean in 2017, USS Theodore Roosevelt did its best to weather rough seas and wind advisories. On that particular day in the middle of a cold October, USS Roosevelt, a military aircraft carrier, was aided by USS Sampson, a guided missile destroyer. As the two ships, alternatively known as CVN-71 and DDG-102, refueled their vessels at sea. Sailors aboard both vessels took special care to ensure it was a successful and safe mission. Against all odds, USS Theodore Roosevelt was able to leave the San Diego coast for its inevitable deployment right on schedule. Welcome to the Mask, also known as the Maneuvering and Seakeeping Basin, kept at NSWC Carter Rock. Recognized worldwide as one of the biggest indoor oceans on the planet, this high-tech testing facility is truly one of a kind. Somewhere in the unknown depths of the Naval Surface Warfare Center lies an underground ocean for sailors' use only. Built to withstand a whopping 12 million gallons of water, this special tank is 360 feet long and 240 feet wide. Both mysterious and mesmerizing, the mask is essential for U.S. Navy to integrate indoor ocean testing storm scenarios. According to Dirk Lesko, president of Bath Ironworks, ship production is proudly back on schedule. Now that the shipyard is up and running as usual, ship delivery is as timely and efficient as ever. With the capacity to build two new ships per year, BIW is dedicated to producing up to 11 ships within the next six years. 
Although they only build two ships a year, it costs upward of $7 billion per ship. Thanks to these skillful shipbuilders, the U.S. Navy is ready to add a few new aircraft carriers to its fleet over the next several years. Meanwhile, the flight deck crew aboard USS Abraham Lincoln looked gravely at the stormy seas. It was June 2017, and the unseasonably high seas were unsettling for this multi-billion dollar Nimitz-class aircraft carrier. As it continued to conduct pre-flight training during the roughest sea conditions, USS Abraham Lincoln carried on despite the weather. That's because its flight deck crew was ready and willing to face anything in the attempt to achieve their flight deck certification. This prestigious military credential would make sure that the air wing and ship wings of the crew are able to both safely recover and launch aircraft. As ships at Naval Station Norfolk prepared for another stupendous storm in Virginia, U.S. Naval Intelligence acted quickly, redirecting them to the Atlantic Ocean. With Hurricane Dorian hot on their heels, Naval Station Norfolk knew exactly what to do, ship its ships and any military aircraft to a safer place before Dorian hit its southern shores. Heavy rains and high winds whipped Norfolk as the U.S. Navy planned its primary strategy to avoid this impending storm. But without weather warning systems, navigating torrential winds would have been nauseating. It was only a few years later in September 2019 when another naval base prepared for the worst. That's where hurricane hunting comes in. High above the Hawaiian Islands, these aircraft soared as the 53rd Weather Reconnaissance Squadron sought to scout data on Hurricane Douglas. As their fourth trip since July 26, 2020 came to an end, their collected data points were used to forecast more precise weather systems. On September 13, 2018, blue skies and green fields greeted Air Force crew members and pilots from the 53rd Weather Reconnaissance Squadron. With Savannah Air National Guard Base as their launch pad, these hurricane hunters were hard at work with another storm task mission. This time, their primary target was Hurricane Florence. During another hurricane hunting expedition, rapid winds swept Keesler Air Force Base as the 53rd Weather Reconnaissance Squadron soared the skies. While their Lockheed C-130 Hercules flew through the eye wall of Hurricane Epsilon, nothing but endless gray was seen for miles around. But the C-130 aircrew and pilot stayed steady, and their effort paid off. Suddenly, a wall of gray gave way to nothing but the most astounding blue. They'd make it, threaded through the needle of Hurricane Epsilon to the windstorm's eerily calm center. As the only U.S. Department of Defense group with the skills to complete this mission, their weather reconnaissance information was even more valuable. Back in Beaumont, Texas, Helicopter Sea Combat Squadron 7 proceeded with a precarious search and rescue mission to scour the damage of Hurricane Harvey. Marines and sailors from the U.S. Marines and Navy sent dedicated aircraft and personnel to the disaster region. Oh. 
However, with the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, in tow, Hurricane Harvey faced a formidable adversary. Citizens stood atop flooded porch steps and rooftops, gazing up as helicopters supported FEMA and Northern Command's relief effort. Together, U.S. Navy and Marines rescued as many stranded citizens as possible, lifting them to safety in their interior. But unfortunately, others weren't so lucky. As Hurricane Irma touched down on the U.S. Virgin Islands, a C-130H Hercules taxi and HH-60 Pave Hawk came to the rescue. Literally. In this case, their search and rescue mission needed as much workforce as possible, seeking military airmen from around America and Puerto Rico to help with this hectic situation. Fortunate hurricane victims streamed from military aircraft onto the tarmac in droves, a perfect example of a successful search and relief mission. Meanwhile, the victims of Hurricane Harvey had a wild ride with the 920th Rescue Wing HC-130N. The destination was Dallas, Texas, and about 30 civilians sat between crew members as aerial refueling began. While they considered relocating to a different point of collection, almost 90 military members of the 920th Rescue Wing were sent to Texas, along with two HC-130N and three HH-60 Pave Hawks. Their role, to support FEMA in Hurricane Harvey relief efforts. Working together as a unit, U.S. Coast Guard joined in to load relief supplies onto a twin-engined HC-144 Ocean Sentry turboprop aircraft in the heart of Mobile, Alabama. With Aviation Training Center as their home base, Enormous amounts of water bottles and other necessities streamed seamlessly onto the aircraft with the aid of a conveyor belt. The U.S. Coast Guard was off to the rescue once again, with safety and security as its top priority. Several years later, U.S. Coast Guard came to support the military response to Hurricane Ida in Clearwater, Florida. More hurricane supplies were loaded by forklift onto an awaiting C-130H Coast Guard aircraft on September 6th. While most of the basic supplies, like potable water, non-perishable food and flashlights, are often taken for granted. In this deadly scenario, they might have made the difference between life and death. Ida's victims were grateful for any help they received. When sailing through high winds and dangerous weather on the seven seas, things can get rough. Thankfully, the U.S. military is well aware of the provisions and training necessary to protect its crew and ships anytime, anywhere. That's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. 
See you next time.